Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I will have to thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, but the uh, smaller the country, the longer the CV, and that's a little bit less difficult for a small country. So uh, don't give too much credit to it. The last time uh, I have been here in Athens, it was at the invitation of the Central Bank, and uh, I already at that time I had the occasion to speak about the typical uh, Central Banker's attitude, which is a long-term view of the situation, and uh, on that time I also had the occasion to speak about uh, pension reform, which to some extent uh, also has happened in Greece. But since six years ago when I have given this speech, a lot has changed, not only in Greece, in the world as large. This was before the crisis. Yet, if much has changed, it has not always changed in the way that many observers predicted it. I still remember clearly in the early weeks of May 2010, the prophetic claims that Greece would leave the Euro area within weeks, that other countries would follow within months and that the collapse of the euro would be complete before the year was out. Those claims were wrong, and the Greek people have played an important part in proving them so. Since the loss of market access in 2010, the Greek people have made extraordinary efforts to refute the naysayers and turn the economy around. They have executed a fiscal adjustment, which I would call of historic proportions, and embarked on the difficult road of structural reforms. The results of these actions have accrued first and foremost to Greece, but they have also accrued to the wider Euro area. However, the turnaround is still not complete. There is still much work to do, and what I would like to emphasize in my remarks today is that staying on the path of reforms is essential not only for the citizens of today, it is above all essential for the citizens of tomorrow. Like all Western societies, and also some rapidly aging Eastern societies, Greece faces long-term fiscal challenges linked to high public debt levels and demographic developments. These challenges raise profound questions about intergenerational justice. And it is only through reforms that they can be answered in a fair way. For all aging societies, this implies, first, ensuring sustainable public finances, and second, achieving stronger economic growth. Both are necessary because they are mutually reinforcing. Fiscal sustainability creates the stability and confidence necessary for future growth, and higher growth in return creates the revenues and debt to GDP ratios necessary for fiscal sustainability. Let me therefore deal with each in turn, starting with what is being done to ensure fiscal sustainability in the context of intergenerational justice. The fiscal challenges that Greece is facing today, while more severe than those of others, are however not unique to this country. All Western societies are being confronted with difficult questions about the distribution of consolidation and spending 
between current and future generations. A first question is how the burden of high public debt levels in Western societies will be shared between generations. This question is particularly pertinent in the Euro area because all countries are bound by the rules to start reducing their debt levels below 60% of GDP. And you know that we have present debt levels on aggregate in the Euro area which are still rising, but we expect peaking this year at above 95% of GDP. If fiscal consolidation starts today, then the generation which has benefited most from this debt will also play the largest role in reducing it. But if consolidation is delayed, then future generations will have to bear the burden of debt reduction and that would constitute a direct transfer from our children and from our grandchildren to our egoistic selves. And it is only us who are taking the decision. Our children and grandchildren have no power to raise their objections. A second question with intergenerational consequences is how to spread the costs of demographic change. In the European Union, it is projected that by 2060, there will be just two working age people for every person above 65, compared with a ratio of four to one right now. This means the weight of supporting an aging population will rest on ever narrower shoulders. If current generations are proactive in reforming pension systems, they can reduce the load that the shrinking working age population will have to carry. But if they choose instead to give priority to their entitlements and try to preserve them, then they make the lives of future generations commensurately harder they would effectively sacrificing their descendants' quality of life for their own. In other words, all Western societies are facing choices about the distribution of responsibility. Do we, the current generation, take responsibility for the long-term fiscal challenges that we have played a large part in creating? Or do we delay and pass the consequences of our choices on to our children and grandchildren? I think it's fairly clear what the perspective of intergenerational justice would imply. This perspective is of course not new. The so-called demographic time bomb has been predictable for many years. Indeed, as I said, I pointed to this issue when I spoke here in Greece in early 2008. But what has changed today is the urgency for action. The crisis has meant that these difficult choices can no longer be delayed. One might say it has pressed fast forward and brought the challenges of the future into the present. This is the broader context for the ongoing consolidation process in Greece. Certainly, it is about increasing spending control and tax collection. But it is also about putting Greece on a sustainable path for the future, limiting the, road, the load that is being bequest on our descendants and ensuring that those that created the fiscal problems take responsibility for them. And indeed, this is what is happening in Greece today. The commitment the Greek people have shown to fiscal consolidation has been remarkable, even by international comparison. 
the primary deficit has declined by almost 10 percentage points between 2009 and 2012. Taking into account the deep and prolonged recession, the underlying fiscal adjustment is even larger. The OECD estimates that structural adjustment was nearly 14 percentage points of GDP during this period. As Greece is one of the smaller Euro area member states, the scale of its efforts is not always appreciated appropriately abroad. If, for example, the level of expenditure consolidation we have seen in Greece were being translated one-to-one -to, -one to a country like Germany, it would be equivalent to a permanent reduction in public spending in Germany amounting to 174 billion euros, which is more than the total spending on social transfers and the social budget inside Germany. Greece has also made important progress in addressing long-term fiscal challenges linked to its aging population. There is little doubt that before the crisis, the Greek pension system was indeed unsustainable. In the Commission's 2009 aging report, age-related spending in Greece was projected to increase from 22% then to a staggering 38% in 2016 if no change would have happened. By contrast, the average for the euro area at that time was 30% of GDP over the same time horizon, meaning 2060. But thanks to the pension reforms that have taken place, the Greek system is now comparable to the rest of Europe. In the 2012 aging report, you can read that age-related spending in Greece is projected to increase to under 30% in 2060. That is some eight percentage points lower than the previous estimate, and which is fully in line with the European average. If we take into account as well the recently decided increase of the pension age, I could even say that Greece is ahead of some other countries in this respect. In short, the Greek people have taken vital measures to ensure long-term fiscal sustainability. This will reduce the burden that will be passed on to future generations. And I recognize that in doing so, current generations have made considerable sacrifices. Real earnings have fallen by over 20% since 2009, undergoing undoing by and large all the gains that had been made since adopting the euro. I also recognize that far too many people are currently without work with unemployment at over 27% and youth employment even reaching 57%. For so much potential to be lying idle is really a tragedy. Nevertheless, this is the painful cost of reversing the misguided economic policies and lack of reforms of the past. And fiscal sustainability and hence intergenerational justice is not yet fully ensured. While the government appears to be on track to meet its 2013 primary balance target, still Greece has to go some way to reach full sustainability with targets of 1.5% primary surplus in 2014 3% 15 and 4.5% in 16. This means that fiscal consolidation has to continue. Based on current projections, a fiscal gap has emerged for 2014. 
It comes mainly from delayed gains from the tax administration reform, shortfalls in the collection of social security contributions, and continuing underperformance of the installment schemes for outstanding tax obligations. Measures will have to be identified to close this gap. Looking forward, failure by the authorities to proceed with tax administration reform and to accelerate the fight against tax evasion will unavoidably widen the fiscal gap and imply the need for higher savings on the expenditure side. This simple truce should provide sufficient incentive for stepping up the pace of tax administration reform. To put tax collection in Greece in context, according to the most recent OECD data, the tax debt or the tax arrears in Greece as a share of the annual net tax revenue was nearly 90%, nearly a full year's tax revenue was in arrears, compared to an OECD average of 14.14%. Fighting tax evasion now is therefore the key to enhance social fairness, both on the intra-generational and inter-generational basis. To this effect, the recently legislated semi-autonomous tax agency will need to become fully operational and shielded from political interference. Beyond that, accelerating the implementation of public administration reform is also key to the success of wider reform agenda. Significant delays have occurred in finalizing staffing plans and transferring employees to the new mobility scheme, and this is slowing down the identification of redundant positions and the necessary modernization of the public sector. Of course, consolidation would be made easier by higher rates of growth. But we should not tre treat growth as an exogenous variable. On the contrary, it depends critically on decisions of the Greek authorities, namely on their willingness to implement the growth enhancing measures that are foreseen inside the program that we decided together. The relatively closed and rigid nature of the Greek economy is both a challenge but also an opportunity. It makes, of course, process of reform harder to many vested interests, but it also means that the potential for reforms to raise growth is commensurately higher in such a situation than if these reforms would already have taken place. Let me therefore return turn to this issue which forms the second part of my remarks today, namely how to strengthen growth. The economic situation in Greece has started to pick up this year with the economy stabilizing and uh, seasonally adjusted real GDPs increasing by 0.2% quarter in quarter in the second quarter of this year. Overall, GDP growth is expected to turn positive next year on a yearly basis at 0.6%. But while these are welcome developments, they still represent a relatively weak recovery, especially given the depths of the recession that has preceded it. In my view, to add momentum to this recovery and lay the ground for medium-term growth, the authorities need to address three challenges. First, increasing the economy's external competitiveness. Second, ensuring that the banking sector is able to fund this recovery. And third, attract productive foreign investment. As Greece is undergoing a structural deleveraging in its public and private sectors, simple sectoral accounting tells us 
that its external sector must go into surplus. The key for growth is to ensure that this happens as much as possible through higher exports rather than through compression of imports. The best way Greece can achieve this is by improving, of course, its price competitiveness. Price competitiveness is particularly important for Greek firms as their exports are more largely concentrated in low-tech products compared to other European countries. At the end of last decade, high-tech or intermediate-tech products represented only 28% of total exports compared to nearly 50% for the EU as an aggregate. Yet, since Euro entry, price competitiveness in Greece has actually been on a worsening trend. According to the Commission, the real effective exchange rate on an HICB basis in Greece was still rising in 2011. To facilitate an export-led recovery, this trend has to be corrected, and there is no way this can be achieved in the short run other by adjusting prices and costs. I know the difficulties that such adjustment creates, and also the criticisms that are leveled against it. But we are in a monetary union, and this is simply how adjustment works in the market economy. Sharing a currency brings considerable microeconomic benefits, but also it requires that relative prices can adjust in order to offset, offset shocks. This process has already begun in Greece today. Thorough labor market reforms have reduced labor costs significantly. Unit labor costs have now fallen by around 18% since 2009, and not only due to rising unemployment. No, the compensation per employee has indeed fallen by about 20% in this period. But the translation of cost competitiveness gains into prices in Greece is simply still too slow. Notwithstanding the encouraging recent trend of disinflation, this is largely because reform in product markets have not kept pace with reforms in the labor markets. And this, is not, this not only limits the potential for the external sector to generate growth, but it also lowers citizens' real income by keeping prices artificially high. Speeding up the pace of product market reform is therefore a priority. The authorities have introduced several recent reforms, for example, removing barriers to entry in transportation services, repealing restrictions in the retail sector, and also removing mandatory recourse to services in a number of regulated professions. However, as of today, product market regulation are still among the most restrictive throughout Europe. Further reform will help remove what I would call unjustified privileges of the few at the expense of the many. And the related excess profits, by helping prices adjust, I think labor product market reform will strengthen also social fairness between labor and products. While product market reforms are an essential part of building a more competitive and fairer economy, their ability to generate growth depends, of course, also on other developments, and in particular, the condition of a supportive banking sector. If banks do not make new loans, this impedes the entry of new players into liberalized sectors which then reduces competitive pressures and also price adjustments. 
And if banks do not write off loans to insolvent debtors, in particular so-called zombie companies, this slows down the necessary reallocation of resources towards exports and higher productivity sectors, the so-called Japanese situation. In other words, cleaning up bank balance sheets and ensuring a well-functioning bank lending channel is an equally important part of the adjustment process. This is the second challenge for growth. The authorities in Greece have taken, in this area as well, important steps to preserve the stability of the banking sector. The recapitalization of the four core banks was completed in June this year, while the consolidation of the banking sector has continued through the resolution of non-viable banks and the absorption of Greek subsidiaries of foreign banks. Deposit inflows, as a consequence, have continued in part offsetting the deposits that had been lost in the previous three years. But despite these improvements, credit growth to the private sector remains quite weak, in particular to the SMEs that make, that make up about 60% of business turnover in Greece. The last ECB survey on SME financing showed that 31% of SMEs in Greece had applications for bank loans rejected, well above the euro area average of 11%. Moreover, the sectoral allocation of credits has not substantially shifted towards the tradable sector since 2010, suggesting that banks are not really facilitating the internal rebalancing from the non-tradable to the tradable sector. To some extent, these developments are cyclical. The weak economic environment means banks are attaching higher credit risks to SMEs. But there is also a more structural explanation, that is non-performing loans. They have increased from 16% at the end of 2011 to 29% of total loans in the first quarter of this year, with the trend still growing. This is acting as a barrier to new lending to higher growth sectors. Unfortunately, this problem is in part also being created by government policy. The ongoing moratorium on auctioning off properties of debtors in default has slowed down resolution of non-performing loans and has also impeded balance sheet restructuring. Moreover, suggestions by policymaking, policymakers about horizontal debt relief for bank debtors are leading to a steep rise in what I would call strategic defaults with banks estimating that 25% of non-performing loans in the mortgage and SME sectors are now already of this so-called strategic nature, meaning lending but being able to service but preferring not to service and to pay back the debt. This deterioration of the payment culture even if in some cases there might be a social consideration worth considering, and it might help individuals on a micro level, it is deeply damaging to the economy as a whole. If continued, it will ultimately lead to higher costs for banks, new recapitalization needs for banks, and further constrictions in bank lending. In my view, to restart lending to the real economy, it is a priority that this self-fulfilling cycle is broken. I welcome the fact that the Greek authorities have established an interagency working group to identify ways to improve the effectiveness of debt resolution processes. Its priority should be to establish a time-bound framework to facilitate settlement of borrower arrears using 
standardized protocols. And I admit that in some cases there might be social hardship which might have to be taken into consideration, but that is then part of fiscal action. This would help remove expectations about future debt relief and, as such, remove the debilitating moral hazard that is being created, created by this situation. Otherwise, the ultimate result would be that excessively high risk premia would become entrenched and as a consequent choke off investment and job creation, thus punishing the whole society for the actions of those that prefer to use what I would call strategic default or opportunistic default. The third challenge for growth, as I said, is to attract productive foreign investment. This is important to add momentum to the recovery in the short term, while also increasing the capital and knowledge base of the Greek economy over the medium term. Indeed, before the crisis, investment in knowledge-based capital in Greece was among the lowest of the euro area. From the available signals, there seems to be a significant investor interest in Greece. While total investment in Greece has fallen by 43% over, over the years 20, 2008 to 2012, FDI flows have recently again become positive again, driven largely by investment in the banking sector. But anecdotal evidence also suggests that foreign interest in the real economy is also growing, with several multinational companies having announced plans to increase their output at Greek units over the coming years. To maximize such investment, I see three actions as being key. First, the authorities need to redouble their efforts to improve the business environment. Product and labor market flexibility is certainly a part of this, and as I said, things have been done in this area. But there is also a wider challenge related to reducing bureaucracy, red tape, corruption. Progress have been made but still Greece ranks second last among Euro area countries in the recent publication of the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. And I fully recognize also the shortcomings of the methodology underlying this index, but nevertheless uh, it gives an indication. Second, foreign investment would naturally rise if privatization were increased. In Last year, it had been foreseen to have revenues amounting to 3.6 billion euros coming from privatization. The result has been 36 times less, 0, 0,1 billion, 100 million. Yet, we see that the example of the port of Piraeus which shows that well-targeted privatization can achieve positive results, since the transfer of management of part of the port, container traffic has tripled, and its market share in the whole Mediterranean has doubled from two, for, has tripled from 2% to 6% of the Mediterranean activity. Third, it is crucial for foreign investors that uncertainty about Greece's medium-term outlook is removed. The greatest source of such uncertainty in the past was persistent questions about Greece's place in the euro area. But thanks to the joint efforts of the Greek people, the authorities, and also the European levels, this seems to have now significantly declined over the last year. The main source of uncertainty today is the continued commitment of the authorities to the program. I therefore trust that the authorities will do everything possible to remove such doubts. Let me now conclude. 
Greece has made tremendous efforts in recent years to close its fiscal deficit. By any standards, what has been achieved can only be deemed considerable and remarkable. But the process of restoring sustainability and growth in Greece is not yet complete, and neither is the progress so far secured. If the authorities fail to address the remaining <coughs> challenges, they will put at risk what has already been achieved. In other words, Greece today stands at a T-junction. On the one side, in one direction lies the path of difficult choices. This is a steep and thorny way, and it requires great commitment to negotiate, but it is the one that will lead to a reformed state, a sustainable economy, and justice between generations. On the other side, in the other direction, lies the path of easy answers. This path is littered with false alternatives, like recurrent proposals for debt restructuring. For some, debt restructuring or larger haircuts on government bonds may seem politically attractive. But such practices can only be the last resort and will bar the access to international markets for much longer. They are by no means a sustainable option to ease a government's financial obligations. They would not help promote fiscal discipline and would create higher costs in the long run. And they would do nothing to address the fundamental weaknesses in the Greek economy. In short, the path of easy answers leads to stagnation, decline, and the overburdening of the young and future generations. From what I see today, I trust that the Greek people know which paths they need to take. A recent poll has shown that 69% of the public supports the euro. And as you know, being part of the euro means taking the tough but necessary decisions. Responsible choices and reliability are the preconditions for solidarity. Greece has already received support from other Euro area countries equivalent to 17,000 euros per Greek citizen. And provided that it complies with the program, those countries are committed to support Greece further until it regains market access. In short, all the conditions are present for Greece to return to prosperity and for the sake of both current and future generation, I will trust that Greece will make the most of them. Thank you for your attention. Hello, thank you. I'm Val Babis from the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, just a quick question, so the European Central Bank moved uh, down the interest rates just yesterday. And I wanted to get a feeler from you on how this could impact the whole process of reform and recovery that you just described. Thank you very much. Do you want to take a couple? Okay. Let, let's take another question and then go to the speaker. Uh, in the front here, with your, please. Jörg Pibo, Levy Institute and Skidmore College. If I understood you correctly, you said that uh, falling wages and prices in Greece are welcome. Uh, we know that a deflationary environment does not tend to be good for the health of banks. So how can you uh, both welcome more deflation and on the other hand emphasize that healthy banks would be important for Greece's recovery. Also, given that the ECB is currently undershooting its 2% mark very significantly, one may wonder why the ECB tolerates 
deflation to this extent in Greece, and perhaps even ask for more, instead of hoping for faster inflation in some other member countries, for instance, those with large current account surpluses like Germany. Thank you. Okay, I think both questions uh, to some extent uh, are related. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, when I say uh, that uh, lower wages and uh, uh, prices uh, are welcome, I make the distinction between so-called good deflation and bad deflation. If I see that a country inside the monetary union uh, cannot devaluate, then it has to proceed by another way to the adjustment of relative prices. And instead of an external adjustment, you have to proceed to an internal adjustment of relative prices. And this is uh, the development that's taken place. But uh, since we speak about comparative uh, prices, relative price adjustment, it also is clear that if other countries uh, would do the same at the same moment, it will be more difficult for the first countries to uh, achieve its adjustment process uh, in a shorter period of time. And from that uh, point of view, uh, since there need to be a difference uh, in the price uh, developments uh, in the country that is adjusting, uh, compared to the other countries, um, it is certainly true that uh, we deliver in, on our mandate of keeping uh, our price developments uh, of uh, close to but below 2% over the medium term. And uh, I think um, this we can uh, consider as price stability, uh, which means that uh, we are not interested or not willing to deviate from our mandate and uh, to create artificial inflation just uh, to allow an artificially price adjustment uh, of lower quality. Because we do not believe that the inflationary environment are socially fair neither. But it is certainly true that uh, the decision to, uh, that we took yesterday has, uh, is related uh, to the medium-term developments uh, of price developments in the price pressures in the euro area that we have been able to observe uh, over the last uh, couple uh, of months. And it is not related only to a one-time uh, negative surprise, uh, which was particularly uh, evident in the October price developments, um, but uh, those price developments uh, to a large extent were due to energy and food prices which are beyond uh, the level of control of monetary policy. So uh, you will see next month we will publish uh, our readjusted forecast for uh, medium term price developments uh, which uh, might well be then showing uh, why we uh, immediately reacted uh, and did not wait until this evidence uh, would have to be published. But again, uh, we have seen in the past Greece having consistently higher wage and price developments compared to its other competitors in the euro area, and that is exactly the reason why now, in order to rebalance, it has to adjust by having, over a certain period of time, lower prices and uh, wage developments. And uh, Greece has done that because it has made the choice, and the people of Greece have made the choice to stay within the euro area, much to the pleasure, displeasure of those who had predicted uh, the implosion of the euro area. I think that's a good point to close on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Please join me again in thanking Mr. Mersh.